The idea is real the moment a person thinks it, and it is real to the extent that it is an idea, i.e. to the extent that I think it or have it. The idea of freedom doesn't develop itself, but rather people develop themselves, and in this self-development naturally also develop their thinking. Whoever goes into raptures over the human leaves persons out of consideration, so far as that the rapture extends and floats in an ideal, sacred interest. The human is indeed not a person, but an ideal, a spook. A spook is a social construct, a concept that influences what we do or what we think. Stoner describes spooks as concepts or ideas that stick around like ghosts, with potential to live long after the individual who created the idea has passed on. Spooks can include gender, race, history, morals, tradition, religion, humanity, nationality, and Santa Claus. A spook is described as a ghost, an idea that can live inside of one's head long after the death of the spook's creator. Spooks can influence what we think is right and wrong, what someone should be proud of, how one may eat, work, socialize, or pray. Spooks can influence what we like in others, what's cool, pretty, ugly, or mature is a spook. A spook exists only because of the individuals that believe in them. According to egoism, there is no objectively right way for an individual or for society to behave. Society itself is nothing more than an abstract idea that can be defined in thousands of different ways. Spooks that society makes sacred are often repeated generation after generation, religiously adopting and living out the traditions set by someone long dead. Hierarchy is the rule of thoughts, the rule of the spirit. Hierarchy often exists because enough people believe it does. Many people are more influenced today not through firepower, but through ideas. Be the ideas based on power, God, laws, morals, humanity, or any other spirit. Now nothing but spirit rules the world. A countless multitude of concepts buzz about in people's heads. And what are those who strive to get further doing? They negate these concepts to put new ones in their place. They say, you're making a false concept of right, of the state, of the human being, of freedom, of the truth, of marriage, etc. The concept of right, etc. is rather the one which we now establish. So the conceptual confusion moves forward. In comparison to beliefs of power, right, and authority, egoism has a straightforward approach. Now as long as you're just hanging there, pay attention. The only rules that really matter are these. What a man can do, and what a man can't do. Here we come upon the age-old madness of the world, which has not yet learned to do without priestliness. To live and to create far an idea that is the human being's calling. And this human worth is measured by the faithfulness of his compliance. It's not true. I'm not obsessed with treasure. Not all treasure is silver and gold, mate. Egoism focuses on the unique, the individual and their interaction with the world. Stoner argues that there is no sacred concept for humanity, that each individual is their own unique. Stoner argues that even nationality, race and gender don't unite people. These social constructs that can influence our behavior are what Stoner famously named spooks. History seeks for the human being, but it is I, you, we, sought as a mysterious essence, as the divine, first as God, then as the human being, humanity, humaneness, humankind. It is found as the individual, the finite, the unique. I am the owner of humanity, am humanity, and do nothing for the welfare of another humanity. Fool, you who are a unique humanity, then you put on airs wanting to live for another than you yourself are. Descartes cognito, ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, has the meaning. A person only lives when he thinks. Thinking life is called spiritual life. Only the spirit lives. Its life is the true life. So just as in nature, only the eternal laws, the spirit or reason of nature, are its true life. In the human being, as in nature, only thought lives, everything else is dead. They had done nothing more than to transform things into the conceptions of things, into thoughts and concepts. 
and their dependence thus became more intimate and dissoluble. As you may have noticed, Sterner is already pecking away at the still popular idea of humanity. By the way, here the substance of right comes to light, it is power. The one who has power has right. Stoner was extremely perceptive for his time to predict how and why humanity would become such a behemoth of an idea, especially in a more post-Christian philosophical and political world. Today, even more so than Stoner's day, humanity has seen the highest or most sacred cause by elites and the masses alike. But what concept is highest for the state? Surely, to be a truly human society, a society into which everyone who is really a human being, i.e. not an inhuman monster, can gain admittance as a member. No matter how far state tolerance goes, it stops at the inhuman monster and what is inhuman. And yet, this inhuman monster is a human being, and the inhuman itself is something human, indeed. Possible only to a human being, not to any beast, it is simply something humanly possible. But even though every inhuman monster is a human being, still the state excludes him, i.e. locks him up or transforms him from a state comrade into a prison comrade. In accordance with other anarchist and socialist thinkers emerging around this time, such as Emma Goldman, Stirner argues that capitalism is enforced by the spook of property. Only what is legally or rightfully yours can be yours in capitalism. The bourgeoisie is based on this alone. A legal title. The bourgeoisie is what he is through state protection, through the grace of the state. He would have to be afraid of losing everything if the power of the state were broken. Stoner also agrees with revolutionaries that the working class hold it in their own power to revolt against their oppressors. So then can an egoist ever seize onto or take up with a party? Yes, only he can't let that party seize onto or take him. That party remains at all times nothing but a game for him. He is in the game, he takes part. An egoist would take part in a revolution because a successful revolt against an oppressive system could be beneficial for all, themselves included. The workers have the most enormous power in their hands, and if one day they became truly aware of it and used it, then nothing could resist them. They would only have to stop work and look upon the products of work as their own and enjoy them. This is the meaning of the labor unrest that is looming here and there. The state is founded on the slavery of labor. If labor becomes free, the state is lost. That Stoner's individualism contains the greatest social possibilities is utterly ignored. Yet, it is nevertheless true that if society is ever to become free, it will be so through liberated individuals, whose free efforts make society. Emma Goldman praised this view of Stoner's in particular, due to its realist and materialist take on class struggle. It appeared to anarchists and socialists at the time that the people had the power to take the wealth of the bourgeoisie if they could convince enough to join the revolution. While the people hold the most enormous power, it is only until they become truly aware of it and used it that nothing could resist them. Stoner's vision for social revolution was promoted by well-known anarchist and feminist Emma Goldman in one of her most popular works, Anarchism and Other Essays, in 1910. Power is a fine matter, and useful for many things, for one goes further with a handful of power than with a bag full of right. You long for freedom, you fools. If you took power, then freedom would come of itself. See, one who has power stands above the law. Egoism tackles oppression differently to most anarchists and socialists. Given over in bondage to a master, I think only of myself and my advantage. His blows indeed strike me. I am not free from them, but I endure them only for my benefit, perhaps to deceive him and make him feel safe with the sham of my patience, or, again, to avoid rousing anger against myself through my insubordination. But because I keep an eye out for myself and my self-interest, I grab the first good opportunity by the forelock to crush the slave owner. Rather than the more organizational approach of the social revolution, it suggests that the unique be prepared to grab the first good opportunity by the forelock to crush the slave owner. Stoner's work influenced socialists and individualist anarchists, including Emma Goldman, Renzo Novator, Tucker, John McKay, and Adolf Brand, the writer of Der Eigene, The Unique. 
the first gay journal in the world. In place of traditional anarchist or statist ideas, Stirner suggested the Union of Egoists, which I'll come back to in a minute. Young people are mature when they twitter like the old. They get rushed through school to learn the same old song, and when they have taken this in, they are declared of age. Anyone into whom the principles of morality get duly engraved will never again get free from moralistic thought, and robbery, perjury, cheating, etc. remain fixed ideas to him, against which no freedom of thought protects him. He gets his thoughts from above, and sticks to them. I also love human beings, not just a few individuals, but everyone. But I love them with the awareness of egoism. I love them because love makes me happy. I love because love is natural to me. It pleases me. I know no commandment of love. I have fellow feeling with every feeling being. And their torment torments me. Their refreshment refreshes me too. I can kill, not torture them. A union of egoists is when two or more egoists agree to take on each other's burdens as their own. It's a unique relationship that can be seen as akin to a partner, a close friendship, or a close camaraderie. A union of egoists, as described by Sterner, is a group that prioritizes mutual aid within the group. You don't need to join or even want a union of egoists to become an egoist. It is rather Sterner's alternative to more official and spooked organizational methods such as parties and unions which usually have a formal membership system. The union of egoists is seen to be nothing more than a tool between individuals with a common goal, not a concept to rule over anyone. My interaction with the world, what does it aim at? I want to enjoy it. This is why it must be my property, and this is why I want to win it. My intercourse with the world consists in this, that I enjoy it, and so consume it for my self-enjoyment. Intercourse is the enjoyment of the world, and belongs to my self-enjoyment. Egoism provides a look at mutual aid while removing spooky concepts like loyalty, obligation, or betrayal. Now me, for example, I can let you drown, but I can't bring the ship into Tortuga all by me once he's savvy. There is more that belongs to you than the divine, the human, etc. Yours belongs to you. Look at yourself as more powerful than what they make you out to be, and you have more power. Look upon yourself as more, and you have more. You are not then merely called to everything divine, entitled to everything human, but owner of what is yours, i.e. of all that you possess the strength to make your own. In other words, you are fit and qualified for all that is yours. In a world of extreme instability, many try to use spooks of godliness, morals, or reliance on external forces to find a feeling of security. Egoism doesn't bother itself with holding onto ideas or concepts that are nothing more than spooks. Remaining unattached to what is not your own can relieve a ton of pressure on troubled minds. I am owner of my power, and I am so when I know myself as unique. In the unique, the owner himself returns to the, the creative nothing, from which he is born. Every higher essence over me, be it God, be it the human being, weakens the feeling of my uniqueness, and only pales before the sun of this awareness. If I base my affair on myself, the unique, then it stands on the transient, mortal creator who consumes himself and I may say I have based my affair on nothing. Being able to separate your unique self from spooks, be it society, religion or any other social construct that imposes itself on the unique. This is a very useful exercise when you're unsure why you think or act a certain way. Sometimes the ideas around us impact our lives in ways we won't even notice. Accepting and promoting spooks because of the benefit to you and those that possess you, aka your loved ones. We see humans latch onto spooks as their god, their law, or their sovereign ruler. An egoist chooses the spooks they subscribe to, rather than having the world impose them onto their unique. Freedom only teaches, get yourselves rid, relieve yourselves of everything burdensome. It does not teach you who you yourselves are. Rid, rid, thus its watchword resounds, and you, eager to follow its call, even get rid of yourselves, you deny yourselves, but ownness calls you back to yourselves. It says, come to yourself. Under the aegis of freedom, you get rid of many kinds of things, but something new oppresses you again. You've gotten rid of the evil one. Evil is left. As you are actually rid of everything, and what clings to you, you have accepted. It is your choice and your pleasure. 
The own one is the freeborn, the one free from the start. The free one, on the contrary, is only the freedom addict, the dreamer, and the romantic. Egoism validates all ways of life, and at the same time allows acceptance of people's spiritual worldviews. Ideas of eternal guilt and shame, such as sin, exist in order to spook and control human behavior. Stoner's work can be mentally beneficial for those who have been heavily exposed to strict religious power or are suffering from religious trauma syndrome. Egoism has many tools that can counter or soothe mental torment caused by religious spooks. For example, leading researcher on religious trauma syndrome, Dr. Marlene Winnell, has found ideas very similar to Stoner's that would be quite valuable in her therapy work. And, and part of this is also um, being a good animal. Uh, I find, I, I found that concept to be incredibly liberating, you know, because uh, animals are not worried about whether they're sinning or you know, breaking commandments or what's going to happen after they die, right? Um, and they're not judging each other and judging themselves. It makes sense that egoism ties so well into therapy for minds troubled by religion. Stoner was a ruthless critic of the formal Christian environment of the 19th century Germany. He wrote at a time when professors were sacked for holding unpopular opinions on Christianity, and his own work had to be censored heavily to avoid targeting from the authorities. We are all of us perfect, and on the whole earth there is not one person who is a sinner. There are lunatics who imagine themselves to be God the Father, God the Son, or the man in the moon, and then the world also swarms with fools who think they are sinners. But as the former are not the man in the moon, so the latter are not sinners. Their sin is imaginary. This concludes my very brief summary of egoism. I've discussed egoism as described by Max Turner in an oversimplified format. I'd recommend reading the unique and its property translation of the Einzige und sein Eigentum by Wolfie Landstreicher for a better understanding of eagles. Or, if you know German, you can read the original, the Einzige und sein Eigentum.